Ganondorf, the Demon King, the Great King of Evil, the Emperor of the Dark Realm, King of Thieves, the Dark Lord. He's one of Nintendo's most iconic and feared villains, infamously reveling in the destruction and chaos left in his wake. And yet among Super Smash Bros. fans, his history has been equally infamous for somewhat less fitting reasons. He planted his roots as a last minute addition to Super Smash Bros. Melee, a game created at a hellish pace that was already pushing its developers past their limits, and as a result, his moveset came almost in full from an entirely different character from an entirely different IP, with very few changes beyond altered character traits and one truly unique move which didn't directly draw from an existing animation. This set the firm template for Ganondorf in the years to follow, and although he's gained some semblance of a unique identity in later installments, He's never been able to fully step out from that raptor-shaped shadow and is widely agreed to be one of, if not the, least faithfully represented characters in the entire Smash franchise. It would be simple if the story ended there, but despite all of this, he's managed to become a fan favorite, and many of his moves, derivative as they may be, remain some of the most well-known of any fighter. As a result, there's an important aspect of this video to make clear right off the bat. It's the second entry in a series. The first video covered Link, and it wasn't approached as taking his existing Smash moveset and changing a few things around to catch him up to Tears of the Kingdom. It was a complete and total overhaul, breaking him down to nothing and rebuilding from the ground up, and for consistency, I'm going to be doing the same thing here. Step with me into a parallel universe for a bit. One where Ganondorf was never added to Melee, never added to Brawl, never added to Smash 4, and now, after heavy anticipation, is finally being put into Ultimate as a late stage DLC character, with an entirely original moveset the developers had plenty of time to work on. It's important to establish this premise up front, because it means that moves like his famous Electric Stomp, or his notoriously powerful Warlock Punch, moves that a lot of fans have fallen in love with over the years, including myself to some degree, simply aren't here. They stem from Captain Falcon after all, a set of circumstances this video's universe never had to deal with, and there's no sense being wistful about any particular attack being removed, because how can you miss something that never existed? Now that I've got that clarified, let's see if we can make the King of Evil a bit more evil. Hey, had any castles fall on you recently? Someone poisoned a swamp you walked in and now your feet itch? Well, sounds like you might need to talk to Morgan & Morgan, America's largest injury law firm and today's sponsor for this video. With over 100 offices nationwide and over 800 local lawyers, along with enough resources to see any case through to the end, they're ready to fight for you to get the justice you deserve. Morgan & Morgan have recovered over $15 billion over the years, so yeah, they've won a lot of cases, but the best part is that unless they win your case, you don't pay anything. No consultation fees, no nothing. I know my audience, I know you're pretty tech savvy. Well, good thing that Morgan & Morgan have completely modernized the injury law process, allowing you to file a claim in eight clicks or less without even having to leave your couch. If you're ever affected by a more realistic issue like a car crash, medical malpractice, slip and fall, defective product, and so much more, the list they sent me isn't exactly fun, but it is important. You can go to Morgan & Morgan at forthepeople.com slash mockrock using my special link in the description and pinned comment, or just dial pound law, that's pound 529, to get representation that will fight hard for your rights. The suit was still out for my wedding I went to and I was thinking like, hey, you know, law firm ad, that'll be cute, but I'm melting under these lights. You're never going to see me in this again. Tears of the Kingdom introduced a new, revitalized Ganondorf to the Zelda franchise, with a broad range of attacks that have turned him into a fantastic Smash candidate from that appearance alone. This moveset will absolutely be bleeding into his DLC Smash incarnation, make no mistake, but my preference is for Smash characters to offer a more comprehensive celebration of their source material's entire lineage rather than largely pulling from only one or two games, so that's going to be the plan here. This means that every incarnation of Ganondorf is going to be represented in one form or another, and a certain amount of inspiration is also going to be drawn from Demise. Ganondorf Ganondorf's primordial form in Skyward Sword, as well as the bestial Ganon that's appeared in many Zelda games. Truth be told, as a big Zelda fan, I'd love it if both Ganondorf and Ganon could make it into Smash as two entirely separate characters, but that's a bit outside this video's scope. I'll settle for what I can manage, keeping the inspiration clear, but also not treading on the pig's tail too much in case he ever gets a crack at his own moveset somewhere down the line. I'm also only going to be pulling from established Zelda canon, because while there's a good reason his Hyrule Warriors appearance has become so well-liked, to name one example, this sorcerer slash 
slash warriors slash shapeshifter already comes with so much canon material to try and unite into a coherent moveset, which I think should get priority. That Hyrule Warriors approach of grabbing from a bit of everything is actually somewhat in line with my approach, though, as we'll get into. Beginning with cosmetics, amazingly, Ganondorf proper has only had four incarnations across the Legend of Zelda's almost half-century history. Given that there are eight costumes to work with for a Smash Ultimate character, this lines up perfectly for each of them to appear, along with a palette swap on top of that. Ganondorf also uses a couple of different weapon types this time around, and as a final quirk to give him that DLC touch, these weapons are actually altered depending on which costume is being used. His default appearance is naturally the samurai-inspired Demon King from Tears of the Kingdom, the most recent incarnation of the character to date. This one's alternate palette is a hyper-saturated variant that alludes to his Oni-inspired upgrade from after he obtains a tier. Ganondorf in Smash is going to wield a total of three different weapon types, less than his Zelda incarnation makes use of even in this one game, but he gets a lot of mileage out of them. His quote-unquote light weapon is the Gloom Sword from Tears of the Kingdom times two, as Ganondorf in Smash dual wields for all light weapon attacks. The Gloom Sword is based on a Japanese katana, which aren't exactly small swords, but it sure looks like it in his massive fist. I doubt a pair would be too much for him to handle. His heavier two-handed attacks instead use the massive Spite Gloom Club, about as appropriately devastating a weapon as the Triforce of Power holder could ever ask for. And finally, the cameo appearance that Ganon's trident makes is modeled off the Gloom Spear. Also, please note that even though different incarnations of Ganondorf get different weapons, these are the only ones I'm going to be referring to throughout the video, and the changes are purely cosmetic between them. Costume 3 is, of course, the classic Great King of Evil from Ocarina of Time. His first introduction to players, and a firm benchmark that future incarnations drew from heavily. His alternate palette is a red-clad, blue-skinned allusion to Aghanim, the mysterious sorcerer who was revealed to be Ganon's alter ego in A Link to the Past, a game which Ocarina of Time can somewhat be regarded as a 3D adaptation of. This incarnation's weapons are the twin blades that he wields as Ganon in Ocarina of Time, obviously scaled down. His trident is Ganon's from A Link to the Past, which also resembles the bony lance that Phantom Ganon swings at the Hero of Time, and his greatsword is the one he used in the Space World demo Nintendo created in 2000, the same sword currently used in Smash by the real Ganondorf. By the way, even though for the sake of this video Ganondorf isn't supposed to exist in Smash, I will occasionally be referencing the real one purely in situations like this where it makes information easier to impart. Moving on, Costume 5 goes to the older and wiser incarnation of Ganondorf from The Wind Waker, another surprisingly agile take on the character alongside Tears of the Kingdom's Demon King, and another one who regretfully has to give up his distinctive cel-shaded look. His alternate palette swaps out those dark robes for blue and yellow as a nod to Maladus from Spirit Tracks, a different Demon King fought by another incarnation of Link in the same timeline as The Wind Waker. His weapons of course lead off with the twin swords he attacks with at the end of The Wind Waker, a perfect fit, then move on to a great sword inspired by the one that Phantom Ganon swings and drops throughout several encounters, and he'll use a trident adapted from the aesthetic of Puppet Ganon. Rounding things off, Costume 7 goes to the Dark Lord from Twilight Princess, who was used as the basis for his real Smash appearance in two back-to-back -back games. Here, he's portrayed as a bit grimmer and more sinister, given that he's now competing against other incarnations, and Twilight Princess has one of the darkest and grittiest aesthetics of any Zelda title. His palette swap bumps down the brightness on his armor even further and exchanges gold for silver and green, mirroring Zant from the same game. That mirroring also applies to his weapons, as the twin swords he uses are based on the same sword that Zant summons to bring Stalord to life in the Arbiter's Grounds. Zant is actually a dual wielder in his own right, so I could just lift those directly, but I think the former is a bit of a better fit for Ganondorf. His two-handed weapon is the Sword of the Six Sages that he wields himself, the same sword that was used to try and execute him, and his trident also takes inspiration from Zant's summon. I went into the costuming phase hoping to be able to fold in a reference to Demise given that he is Ganondorf in all but name, but for precisely that reason, his color palette is kind of accounted for already. On the topic of color palettes, the nebulous purple energy that makes up the bulk of real Ganondorf's particle effects in the Smash series has been replaced with purple and red, in line with the gloom he manipulates in Tears of the Kingdom, and this applies regardless of which costume is being used. It's still going to be illustrated as purple here for the sake of clarity though. A few final aesthetics to wrap up. Ganondorf's up taunt is a maniacal laugh with his head thrown back, which he can do for quite a while unless he cancels it. His side taunt is an arrogant beckon towards his opponent, and for down taunt, he faces the camera and holds up his hand, revealing the glowing Triforce of Power. He appears in a burst of energy for his entrance animation. His sleep and shield break are variants of the classic one-handed lean he's adopted many times in Zelda, and for his parry, yeah, of course Ganondorf can smack away your puny attack. For victory animation 1, he sits on the throne of Hyrule and laughs. Animation 2 has him laughing even harder, then summoning a burst of energy that shatters the very earth the victory ceremony takes place on, as he plunges off camera into 
into the depths. And for the final possibility, he plays an organ along to his victory theme with his back turned, then flourishes towards the camera. Now moving into gameplay direction, the number one aspect of the Triforce of Power holder that needs to be conveyed in Smash is, of course, power. Ganondorf seeks to oppress and dominate and has no issue plunging headfirst into battle, which gets reflected in his moveset with devastating attacks and strong burst movement abilities that let him close the gap between him and his sniveling opponent as fast as possible. That's not to say that recklessly rushing in is all that Ganondorf is capable of, though. He sets bait. He conjures legions of phantoms to do his bidding. He corrupts the world around him. He vanishes and reappears behind his opponent's back. He pledges false allegiances. Ganondorf is a deceiver and a betrayer, and ideally his smash moveset should also capture some of that underhandedness. That doesn't mean he needs to have an extremely unintuitive moveset, Ganondorf doesn't really seem like the type for bewildering gimmicks or finger-breaking combos, but he'll have tools to make his opponents uncomfortable and heavily reward him for getting inside their head. He's actually always had a bit of a gotcha feel in his boss battles, something that Tears of the Kingdom pushed a bit harder, so it fits all around. As far as his attacks go, this version of Ganondorf is a mid-range fighter, employing an arsenal of weapons, powerful sorcery, and of course, his fists. Because say what you will about the King of Evil, he's not afraid to get his hands dirty. Ganondorf starts off unarmed and materializes weapons into existence whenever needed in a burst of gloom energy, which dissipate away after his attack is finished. This kind of multi-weapon fan design can be a bit contentious among enthusiasts and admittedly does risk coming across as overly busy, but A, it's a very convenient way to work more of a character's canon into their Smash representation, and I do like to keep these movesets pretty canonically faithful both as a personal preference and because I think it translates to video better, and B, even in the Zelda series, this is just blatantly who Ganondorf is now. Now, one notable weapon that won't be appearing in this moveset is his newfound bow from Tears of the Kingdom, alongside most of the vast array of projectiles he's utilized over the years. I'm personally a fan of the heavy zoner archetype, but I have to admit, I think trying to convey sheer power through extensive zoning is a tough prospect, and it's also a direction that can start veering off into frustration territory very quickly, especially at a casual level. That's not to say longer ranges won't be given any consideration, but they will be getting handled with a pretty light touch. That consideration goes both ways as well, because Ganondorf comes equipped with some anti-projectile tools to make long gaps against proper zoners a bit less formidable. Rounding out his list of pros, he has some air movement options to work with, and alongside his super heavyweight status, he can be pretty robust and difficult to KO. Now, naturally, there's a price to be paid for all of this. The real Ganondorf is infamous for consistently being one of the slowest and most cumbersome fighters in Smash, and in this video's universe, he's actually slower. Not by that much, but enough for him to lag behind even Incineroar as the definitive worst runner in Smash. Ganondorf is also a big target, which makes him easy to hit and easier to carry around the stage with the exact kinds of prolonged combos he despises performing himself so much, his high weight also coming through here as a double-edged sword. A slow air dodge and lack of any quick combo breakers in the air don't exactly help with this issue either. As with many mid-range fighters, he can also be a bit uncomfortable trying to fight at point-blank range. He has some close quarters tools to draw from, more than the real Ganondorf has ever had, but they're not among the absolute upper echelon, and if he finds himself constantly having to scrap, the match is likely not going in his favor. The other extreme, being camped out with long-range zoning, can be an issue as well, even though he does have some tools to deal with it. Going into finer detail, most of his base stats are perfectly okay to line up with the real Ganondorf, although, as I mentioned, he does have slightly reduced run speed. His air speed and acceleration have been given a slight boost in compensation, but Wolf he is not. Ganondorf is still going to need to maneuver pretty extensively before he's able to jump in on an opponent. As far as special traits, passive abilities, anything like that to cover, there aren't any. This take on Ganondorf will have a bit of spice on some attacks, he is a DLC character after all, but I intentionally chose to stay away from any comeback mechanics or something of that nature which has started popping up more and more on official movesets. There was certainly potential to do something with that, but if Ganondorf is supposed to be the physical embodiment of power, then I think his Smash incarnation should provide plenty of power at all times. I also looked at having certain moves in his kit spread gloom on the ground, but that didn't seem especially fun. There was a lot of stuff like that. I think Ganondorf is best served without getting too stuck in the weeds as far as mechanics go. Beginning with Jab as we head into his moveset, Ganondorf performs a quick back fist strike, a single hit with decent startup as well as good knockback for a jab, killing lightweights at the ledge starting around 120%. Ganondorf has a long and proud history of backhanding people across the Zelda series, which makes this a natural choice for a close quarters option. It's got solid range for a jab, but nothing exceptional, and is relatively safe on shield, but nothing exceptional. It does have one exceptional trait though, 
It's a reflector, which sends projectiles back with the same damage they started with and slightly higher speed. This is once again very much par for the course for him, and is also admittedly a bit of a vanity addition as when I'm in my Link video with the same format, he also had a reflector jab, which I think is a cool parallel given all the energy tennis these two have played over the years. Speaking of energy tennis, this particular reflector has a bit of a quirk beyond just being attached to a normal, which we have seen before. If Ganondorf reflects a projectile, it becomes encased in bright light and crackling electricity just like his famous Dead Man's Volley from the Zelda series. Any projectile in this Dead Man's Volley state can be reflected just by hitting it. Very comparable to King Dedede's Gordo, and is sent back with the same damage and slightly higher speed. Now, here's the kicker. Hitting a projectile that's in the Dead Man's Volley state does not remove it from that state. And what this means is that Ganondorf and his opponent can play energy tennis with any projectile in the entire game, mostly at longer ranges where there's time for both characters to recover from the end leg of their moves. There's a limit of three reflections in place, indicated by the energy getting louder and more unstable after the final return, which prevents the game from stalling for too long and also generally keeps this ability advantageous for Ganondorf. That's right, after putting up with Link's nonsense for all these years, Ganondorf finally gets to have the last laugh in a volley. In a one-on-one -on -one fight, he reflects the initial projectile, then his opponent reflects it, at which point it becomes unstable. Then he reflects that unstable projectile, which splits it into a multi-pronged shotgun blast that's also been a hallmark of the Dead Man's Volley in Zelda. This one does a flat 10% damage if all parts connect regardless of the source projectile, with unimpressive knockback and low shield damage. An opponent caught in this situation is going to have to shield or jump away, which they will be able to anticipate, but being forced into these actions still gives Ganondorf a bit of a head start to close in. Still in his favor, but hey, most reflectors don't give opponents this amount of counterplay in the first place, they should probably take whatever they can get. Moving on to tilt attacks, forward tilt is the Demon Needle, a very long range standing thrust with a trident. This exact attack with Ganondorf standing proudly upright is very comparable to Yu Ganon from A Link Between Worlds, but there's certainly been no shortage of trident attacks among Ganon appearances, and Tears of the Kingdom also saw the Gloom Spear being used in a similar fashion. It's not too dissimilar to his stab attack from Twilight Princess either. This has a tipper sweet spot, as you'd expect, but the real sweet spot is actually slightly behind the tip. The trident is at its absolute strongest if Ganondorf impales his opponent on all three prongs rather than just the longest central one. Connecting with any number of them is still better than landing the shaft's sour spot though, which is quite weak. This is the only appearance that a trident makes in his moveset as it's usually reserved more for Ganon. The Zelda devs kind of had to go out of their way not to make a gloom trident for him in Tears of the Kingdom. That doesn't mean it should be written off though, in fact, it's far and away one of his most important tools. It's a poke which can outrange any brawler and even the majority of mid-range competitors, making it a dominant force in the neutral and an absolutely vital gap-closing alternative when he doesn't want to commit to a burst option. It's also angleable, giving it some use as an anti-air and particularly as a safe two-framing and ledge pressure tool, and the three-pronged sweet spot, while not offering quite the same kind of competitive reach, will kill at percentages comparable to Ultimate's weaker forward smashes. Down Tilt is a synchronized pair of inward sword slashes called the Dark Bite, which trades off forward tilt's range for better speed and some combo potential, as it launches opponents almost straight up with only a slight forward trajectory. This attack is taken from a similar one performed in the Wind Waker, but aimed a bit lower down. Animation aside, sweeping ankle cuts are a common combo starter given to many sword fighters in Smash, and while Ganondorf's take on the move isn't bad by any means, it's not a standout either. It's largely safe if spaced precisely, but its frame data isn't going to blow anyone's mind, and its combo potential falls off faster than some, with knockback growth that sends opponents too high for follow-ups at very high percents, although there is a band where it will confirm into up air. That extremely vertical launch angle sounds generous, but in reality, it's just a necessity for the move to function properly at all, given that Ganondorf has abysmal airspeed as well as an up air that doesn't have the world's greatest horizontal range. The final tilt attack to talk about is Heaven's Rupture. Ganondorf takes both Gloom Swords and thrusts them above and in front of him and across, before quickly separating them in downwards arcs to either side of his body. These secondary arcs come out fast enough and with enough coverage that they'll probably be the main part of the move, with the frontal arc launching opponents upwards and the back sending them at a much more moderate angle that won't leave much room for follow. Ups. This kind of split strike once again has origins in the Wind Waker, and if you're really good at calling out jumps, it's the move for you. It's a multi-hit attack, and if you manage to land the more precise initial crossed blades, it'll lock an opponent in place to be hit by the follow-up slashes, delivering additional damage and knockback growth. This makes the sweet spot more rewarding both as a combo
combo starter and for killing, and it can also come up in, say, chasing someone on a platform, as those crossed blades will poke through. Although, as an alternative, you can also just stand underneath the center of a platform and cover most of it with those secondary slashes. Going back to pure ground coverage, dash attack is the king's elbow. Ganondorf braces himself with his elbow thrust out and launches forward at high speed, with range good enough to cross up shields, solid kill power, and surprisingly little end leg, to the degree that connecting only the last couple of frames of the move on an opponent's shield will be safe against most characters. This move's origins are a bit of a mutt. The elbow was inspired by his leaping elbow strike into a spinning slash from Twilight Princess, but the grounded drive forward he does is more akin to his gap closer with the Gloom Spear in Tears of the Kingdom. It's somewhat comparable to the real Ganondorf's iron shoulder, with the benefit of some extra reach thanks to a further lunge and his extended elbow, as well as being even safer on shield, at the cost of the total removal of the shoulder's combo-enabling sour spot. Continuing on into smash attacks, Ganondorf's forward smash is the Castle Breaker. He grips the Gloom Club with both hands, brings it behind him, and swings it in a massive overhead arc as he leaps slightly into the air, before crashing it wildly into the ground. The concept of an overhead blow should once again be familiar to fans of the real Ganondorf in Ultimate, and for good reason. It's been a common technique of his all throughout the Zelda series, whether performed with a sword or a club. This one has some serious heft behind it. Picture the momentum of a sledgehammer hammer during a two-handed swing, which means that the arc covers most of Ganondorf's body, the back portion acting as a sour spot, and the front portion as one of the strongest forward smashes in the entire game. Connecting it at the very tip will leave him safe against some characters, but overall, it's your typical hard-hitting but risky monster. On the topic of taking risks, Down Smash is the Demon Meteor. Ganondorf spreads his arms and gathers energy into himself before letting it loose in a massive explosion. At frame 60 startup, a full second, it's slower than even the turnaround Falcon Punch, but makes up for it with incredible coverage and truly ludicrous power, killing at sub 40% near the ledge and breaking full shields from scratch. This particular implementation is taken from the blast that Ganondorf uses in Tears of the Kingdom to disable the sages before his final one-on-one -on -one confrontation with Link, but shockwaves have a recurring presence in both Ganondorf and Ganon's arsenal. It gets even stronger if you charge it, like with any smash attack, but the charge point begins quite early in the animation. You can't just knock someone off stage and then prep an instant release explosion to use the moment they get back. I'm trying to avoid talking about the real Ganondorf's design outside of using him as a point of reference, but to break away from that for just a moment, I'm okay with him having ultimate power kinds of moves like the Warlock Punch or Volcano Kick. They're fun, Appropriate for the Triforce of Power Holder, and I think even in a world where Ganondorf truly didn't exist, I'd still independently decide he should have a move like that. Move slots like Neutral Special or Up Tilt aren't good candidates, though. These are categories that are just too important to be thrown away for impractical stunts, especially on an archetype that's starting off inherently disadvantaged. Down Smash is a more disposable move category, happens to fit perfectly for some good canon representation, and its better coverage compared to the real Ganondorf's moves make it at least vaguely more practical. Keeping things powerful in a different way, Up Smash is the Dead Man's Volley. Ganondorf thrusts his hands above his head, summoning a multi-hit ball of energy that traps opponents inside before sending them flying upwards at great speed. The size of the energy ball increases the longer it's charged first, and he gets additional launcher hitboxes at his feet to help send opponents into it. It's somewhat comparable to a two-handed version of Mewtwo's Galaxy Force, but there's a catch. Partway through the attack, if Ganondorf holds the button down again, he'll throw the energy ball forward as a projectile instead of letting it explode right away. It loses some kill power in this form, but will still do the job at higher percents, and carries opponents along its trajectory for a couple character lengths before exploding and sending them sideways. This works even if they were already caught in the initial hitboxes above Ganondorf's head. If he decides he wants to throw them forward inside the energy ball instead of launching them up, he has that option. As you may imagine, this projectile can be used to play energy tennis the same as for projectiles hit by his jab, except this time the reflector count is 4, the opponent reflects it, then Ganondorf, then the opponent, then Ganondorf breaks it, meaning that he still gets to have the last laugh. Heading into our first aerial of the video, Ganondorf's neutral air is the Hurricane Back Fist, a quick sweep of his arm as he does a full rotation and emits a trail of gloom from his fist, which makes it slightly disjointed. This is an embellished version of the same type of attack he performs for his jab, and as you may expect, that also means that it can be used to play energy tennis in midair, where it works exactly the same way. Beyond that, a frame 5 startup makes it a decent out of shield option, not the best on the roster, but a solid pressure alleviator that he desperately needs, even if connecting it this way won't lead to too much. It 
it will kill, but is a long way from Ganondorf's strongest kill move, and doesn't have any kind of combo potential if done rising, although if he does it while landing, it will lead to some combos earlier on. In addition to the Gloom Trail, the Hurricane Backfist also comes with some subtle wind particle effects, which alludes not only to his obvious association with wind in The Wind Waker, but also to Demise in Skyward Sword, and even Tears of the Kingdom to some extent. Ganondorf's Crownbreaker forward air brings range back to the table in a major way, as he grabs the Gloom Club with both hands and delivers a huge overhead swing, similar to his forward smash. The arcing forward air is another familiar sight among Smash sword fighters, and the Crownbreaker is the slowest of all of them by a fair margin. It's a respectable trade-off though, because in return he gets some of the best range of any of these, as well as the highest damage and kill power. It's got more landing lag than you necessarily want for a spacing aerial, but it delivers so much damage and pushback that it becomes totally on punishable on shield if even moderately spaced. It does have enough wind-up time to be anticipated in many scenarios though, and if he whiffs it or gets spot dodged or parried, he's probably toast unless it's done from absolute max range. It's certainly a useful move and makes for some fearsome edge guarding, but takes good planning to get the most out of it. For Ganondorf's back air, he performs the ruinous whims, spinning once in the air before delivering a staggered pair of horizontal slashes using his twin swords. It comes out quicker than forward air, but at the cost of some vertical coverage and kill power. Still a strong stock taker mind you, but anything up against that massive club swing is going to look underwhelming. This attack is loosely adapted from similar flourishes that Ganondorf performs in the Wind Waker, and because it's a multi-hit, it's got a bit of utility hidden under the surface. The first sword swing pops opponents into the second one, so if he times it well so that only the first hit connects, it can be used as a combo starter, similar to what some other ultimate characters are able to do. The frame data across it and the rest of his moveset prevents anything too fancy, but a turnaround grab, jab, those kinds of things should be viable. As you'd imagine, this one also comes with some wind particle effects. There are two slashes, and he talks about two different types of wind that brought death to his kingdom in the Wind Waker. I thought it was fitting. Ganondorf delivers the Underworld Quake for Down Air, a heavy double-footed stomp. This is a stall and fall, but a very short one that only drops him down about a character length before its momentum starts petering out. The sweet spot on his feet is a spike, and if Ganondorf lands on the ground, he'll send up a powerful shockwave around him which deals hefty shield pushback and can even potentially kill at very high percent. This is another piece of Ganon inspiration, with his landing animation directly adapted from A Link to the Past, and… okay, I'm breaking this video's premise just a bit by letting him keep some semblance of his classic electric stomp that he uses in his real moveset. For the fans, if I was trying to predict what the actual developers would do here, I think the more natural choice is the ground pound that Ganondorf performs in Ocarina of Time, which has a very similar application. Speaking of similar applications, Up Air sees the return of the Dead Man's Volley. Similar to his Up Smash, Ganondorf summons a huge, multi-hit ball of energy in his hand, that he can either use to knock opponents into the sky, or throw as a projectile, which in this case will be sent at a downwards angle but otherwise have identical properties to its grounded version. This is the more traditional form that the Dead Man's Volley tends to take in Zelda games, and as a smash aerial, it slows Ganondorf's fall speed while it's being used, which helps him set up the projectile as well as makes the multi-hits linked together more reliably. It covers a ton of space above him, but that doesn't magically turn Ganondorf into a master juggling character. There are plenty of up airs out there with better horizontal coverage, and his miserable mobility can make it tough to position himself just right. That air stall can also be a bit of a monkey's paw because it makes him extra prone to reversals if a falling opponent manages to get past him. Still, it's a gigantic long-lasting, lethal aerial that comes with additional utility. Can't be complaining too much. Now plunging ahead into those all-important special moves, Ganondorf's neutral special is Warlock's Defiance. This is the legally mandated float mechanic that must be added to any fan move set of his under threat of the Gulag. Here, Ganondorf can travel freeform in any direction, moving exactly as fast as his regular airspeed horizontally and descending much faster than it can rise. If he spends the entire time going straight up, he can build a bit of height, but nothing impressive. Using it is simple. Just tap the special button to start floating and tap it again or do anything else to cancel it. Being able to cancel a mobility move into whatever he wants sounds pretty powerful, and yeah, it's an important tool. But there is a 20 frame window where he's locked into the startup animation, so any kind of finger-breaking Peach-style float cancel tech isn't in the picture. A bit fiddly for Ganondorf anyways, he's here to hit stuff. It won't put him into freefall if it expires, although like with most mobility specials, he won't get it back unless he touches the ground or gets hit again. If done from the ground, Ganondorf automatically leaps into the air first, at a distance between full hop and short hop heights. 
Like the King himself, Side Special has multiple incarnations, the first of which we'll cover being Bestial Rampage, the form it takes when done on the ground. Ganondorf readies himself for an instant, then dashes forward at high speed, totally enveloped by energy that takes the shape of a charging boar. This is another bit of Ganon inspiration coming into the moveset, and while charging at Link is a common tactic in Zelda, this is a direct allusion to Phase 2 of the boss fight in Twilight Princess. The energy summon avoids having to scale it way down, which I thought would look a bit underwhelming, and also allows him to stay pure purely Ganondorf without ever having to transform directly into Ganon, which is in line with this moveset concept. The charge comes with armor that can stoke up up to 12% damage, allowing him to tank small projectiles and many lighter normals, and kills very early at the start, and respectably right up until the end. It's a rewarding, tricky, powerful burst movement option, but you can't be throwing it out too haphazardly. Not only is it on the leggy side in general, and enormously so if it collides with a wall on a casual stage, but on top of that, if the board charges off a ledge, it'll just keep going. Were you expecting a rampaging beast to do anything else? And it's also going to drop like a brick because it's fully affected by gravity. Its expiry timer does accelerate whenever the boar's feet aren't on the ground, but charging off the side of a stage can still potentially put Ganondorf in a terrible position because he can't voluntarily cancel the move. On the other hand, it does allow him to charge off a platform and keep going on the ground underneath for a bit. That's the ground taken care of, but if Ganondorf uses side special in the air, he'll instead activate bestial wings. In this environment, Ganondorf envelops himself in the guise of a fiery bat, rushing forwards at tremendous speed with a trajectory that can be slightly curved up and down. Blazing bats or fire bats are enemies that Ganon has summoned in several fights against Link, usually more so as minions that function as projectiles rather than taking that form himself. Having said that though, Ganon is shown directly turning into a bat after his defeat as Aghanim in A Link to the Past, so this smash move is kind of an amalgamation. The bat both starts up and travels considerably faster than the boar, but lacks any armor and the same kind of raw kill power. It will kill though. Rather than the boar's powerful single hit, the bat is a multi-hit attack that drags opponents with it into a final sideways launcher. It may not have too much kill confirmed potential, but because it covers space faster than the boar, even taking the time to jump off the ground into account, it's still very useful for ending a few combos where no other move in Ganondorf's kit could reach. As the Smash series has progressed, more and more side special burst options allow characters to act out of them afterwards, but that's not the case here. Unlike with Bestial Rampage, Bestial Wings will put Ganondorf into free fall after it terminates. That doesn't make it a bad recovery option, just a final one, and because it drags opponents with it and has a decent launcher, it's one of the better moves in the game at carrying opponents into the blast zone for early kills. Just don't expect Ganondorf to make it back either. For down special, the Deceiver's Step, Ganondorf performs a mid-range teleport, disappearing in a burst of energy and reappearing a fixed distance away. On the ground, it travels completely horizontal and brings him a bit further than he could reach with any normal, and if done in the air, he'll reappear lower, at around a 30 degree angle. This can be used as a mobility tool like he frequently does within the Zelda series, but be careful. Doing it on the ground will still send him past the ledge, it's another move that puts him into free fall, and if he's trying to recover with it, it won't snap to ledge until he fully rematerializes. In the same vein as Meta Knight's Dimensional Cape, Ganondorf can also choose to initiate an attack after the teleport by keeping the special button held down. If started from the air, connecting on an aerial opponent, or connecting on a grounded opponent from the front, Ganondorf will deliver a brutal overhead punch, sending them flying away with solid knockback. If he materializes directly behind an opponent while they're both on the ground, however, Ganondorf instead delivers a straight punch to their spine, sending them into a crumple state long enough for him to follow up with a grab or any of his faster attacks. These punches are never especially safe if they're blocked or dodged, but this one in particular is horrifically unsafe on shield, and takes pretty good spacing to go for in the first place. The high payoff is worth going for though, and this also gives Ganondorf a universal way to navigate around closer range projectiles, including reflected ones, which should make the mind games around energy tennis very interesting. And for Ganondorf's final special move, Dark Ascension, we have another modal teleport, this time vertically, as Ganondorf delivers a spin attack with his twin swords while leaping upwards and vanishing. Any opponent caught in this barrage is launched into the air, perfectly positioned for Ganondorf to reappear above them and skewer them on one of his blades as he drags them to the ground, leaving them pinned in a flattened state the same as something like Snake's down throw. From here, Ganondorf has two choices. He can do nothing, in which case he'll just pull his sword out and leave his opponent to choose a 
get up option for him to try and chase, or alternatively, he can hold the special button down during his descent, in which case he'll keep them pinned and deliver an overhead slash with his other sword, leading to a guaranteed launch away with some kill power. This secondary attack can be performed even if he didn't manage to pin anybody, so it provides at least a bit of a landing mix-up if he whiffs. As with down special, teleportation is a recurring ability in Zelda, and this also comes from a similar spinning leap that Ganondorf performs to get behind Link in Twilight Princess. If you zoom out far enough, I don't think it's technically a teleport, but it's meant to feel like one in most contexts. He's not opposed to borrowing the spin attack from time to time in other appearances either. It's also worth mentioning that it has some looping potential, similar to what the real Ganondorf can do with Flame Choke. Funny enough, unlike with Danar's intentional nod, I actually didn't originally set out to emulate this. He's got a couple of different modular attacks already, and that's because they allow for a power move set that still has some versatility and deceptive versatility at that, both themes of his, and then there was a very solid canonical starting point that naturally invited the kinds of strengths and weaknesses I wanted his up special to have, and oh, wouldn't it be interesting if it did something a bit different than the existing up and down sword plunges in Ultimate, and hey, there you go, we're slipping into overlap with the real world, which I'm cool with. Knocking an opponent down over and over is pretty evil after all. As far as recovery specials go, it doesn't travel especially high and won't snap to the ledge until Ganondorf begins to descend, so it's a bit risky. But with a float and BCL wings to help mix things up, not the end of the world. Dark Ascension can also be used for kamikaze, similar to something like Krom or Cloud's up special, with Ganondorf keeping his opponent skewered as he plunges down. He always dies first, though. That's just how ultimate works. And then we have grabs and throws. Ganondorf doesn't have the same kind of command grab that many heavyweights are blessed with, and his standard grab is on the slow end at frame 8, compared to frame 6 for ultimate's fastest grabs, but he has long arms, and often gets a good reward for managing to snag his opponent. His dash grab assists with this, as he stretches out his hand and lunges forward with a distance and speed that are disproportionately good compared to his ground mobility. This is aligned with his generally good burst movement tools, and is inspired specifically by a similar lunge that he performs against the Sages of Twilight Princess, which you may also recognize as the the inspiration for the real Ganondorf's flame choke. He's actually just generally a fan of lifting people into the air by their neck, so this gets adapted into a distinctive grab animation. And for his high damage pummel, he delivers an underhanded punch to his opponent's torso. It's an overall good match for his grabbing pose, and also has some roots in a similar strike that Demise performs in Skyward Sword. Once he's done pummeling, Ganondorf's forward throw is the Dark Dismissal. He roughly tosses his opponent down onto their knees, then delivers a front kick to their face, sending them flying away at a very harsh, almost complete horizontal angle. Ganondorf performs a similar kick in Twilight Princess, which was also used as the base for his real moveset's forward tilt. This is a phenomenal throw for setting up edge guards, can lead to tech chases at mid percents, and even works as Ganondorf's primary kill throw later on. Just a great move overall, and easily one of the best forward throws in the game. Then back throw is the Phantom Razor. Still in his grab pose, Ganondorf erupts into red and purple energy, switched out for a phantom that continues to hold his opponent in place. Ganondorf proper then materializes behind his opponent and delivers a pair of horizontal slashes to their back, sending them flying, and he also hits the Phantom as collateral damage, which shatters and quickly dissipates. Even though they couldn't fit into his core Smash moveset, Phantoms are a ubiquitous part of Ganondorf's schemes in the Zelda series, more so than ever in Tears of the Kingdom. And, of course, he's no stranger to backstabbing either. At 16% damage, this is an extremely painful throw. In fact, it's the highest damage back throw in the game without some kind of resource mechanic attached to it, but it won't kill at reasonable percents. Ganondorf's down throw is the Underworld Slam. He windmills his arm, opponent still in his clutches, before throwing them forcefully into the ground and causing them to bounce back up. This one isn't inspired by any one thing in particular, but it pairs nicely with his distinctive grab animation. It's a combo throw that works decently well, leading into things like dash attack, back air, or bestial wings up to mid percents. And then, for his final up throw, Ganondorf delivers the evil dive. He lifts himself and his opponent into the air, then quickly plunges back down, carrying them in the crook of his arm and slamming them aggressively into the ground as he lands. This is inspired by that ground pound in Ocarina of Time mentioned earlier, and Ganondorf unleashes a similar shockwave here that can break items, smack away other characters or something like Luma, etc. The evil dive is another kill throw, and it's not the best at the job, a character as strong as Ganondorf is hoping to finish things off before he has to resort to it, but it's a killing up throw. Those are always nice to have. While he doesn't gain quite enough height to land on something like the top of Battlefield, he can drag opponents onto lower platforms, which potentially
essentially gives the dive's kill power at least a bit of a boost. A couple small things to wrap up before the finale. Ganondorf's ledge attack has him swing himself onto the stage and deliver yet another overhead punch into the ground. His getup attacks are different variants of rising spin attacks with his twin swords. He does a full body lean into the background for a spot dodge, balanced unnaturally on one leg, and his forward and back roll are based on the surprisingly nimble flips that he can perform in the Wind Waker and Tears of the Kingdom. He turns invisible for his air dodge and has got great travel distance, but is also frame 4 like a lot of his fellow heavyweights, which, yeah, it makes some absolute combo food. And then, at last, we have the all-important final smash to end on. Triforce Corruption. The camera zooms in on Ganondorf as the full Triforce close behind him, but something's wrong. It's being completely overtaken with red and purple. Wait, the entire stage is turning red. As the camera zooms back out and a horde of gloom hands erupt from Ganondorf's back, lunging towards their prey. Any unfortunate opponent who gets ensnared is dragged into an alternate scene, where they turn around and see an enormous wave of gloom energy bearing down on them at great speed. Charging forward within this wave is an entire army of Ganondorf's minions from across multiple Zelda titles, assembled through the power of the Triforce and in a frenzy to do their master's bidding. A pair of colossal, glowing eyes reveals itself in the center of the wave, and then the outline of a great boar can be made out around them, or maybe a dragon, it's hard to tell. It lets out a deafening bellow as this horrific force effortlessly rolls over anyone in its path, at which point we cut back to the stage and they're sent flying. Ganondorf has the Triforce. It's over. And now that it's over, we finally have a full new Ganondorf to look at. Coming back to reality, I know that there are plenty of people out there who are perfectly fine with Ganondorf's current design in Smash, and actively don't want to see him become a weapon user, or a zoner, canon representation doesn't really matter to them, or maybe Ganondorf should be reworked but keep just part of his moveset, or maybe keep him the same but introduce Toon Ganondorf or Ganon, or yeah, maybe totally rework him or mostly rework him and give all of his moves or most of his moves to Black Shadow from the F-Zero series. Series. Look, this kind of stuff has all been discussed in Smash Enthusiast circles so much that I just don't really find it that interesting to talk about anymore, which is exactly why I like this parallel universe format where I can just completely sidestep it. For the record, the real Ganondorf is one of my all-time favorite characters to play in Ultimate and has some cool stuff that I wouldn't necessarily need removed. But I'm still not happy with how stagnant his design has become and would vastly prefer an implementation closer to this. Even if this moveset doesn't speak to you, I think it's hard to argue against it being a much more accurate depiction of Ganondorf as he appears in Zelda and, in my opinion, it translates quite a bit of his spirit into the Smash series. He plots from a distance before charging in, he has extremely powerful moves that can be his undoing if misused, a lot of his most recognizable canon abilities are present. It's my second time doing an amalgamation of a character's long-running canon, and the second time that I've just straight up run out of room for attacks. There were more I'd love to be able to include, particularly from Tears of the Kingdom and Twilight Princess, but a lot of those can be described as some variant of Ganondorf swings a sword, and there were other more iconic targets to be hit first. Also, while I was keeping competitive balance in mind during the design process, I don't think tierless placement is something to really worry about too much for a hypothetical character. Having Having said that though, he'd have to be better than the real thing, right? Ganondorf's been arguably the single worst character in every Smash game for 15 years now. There's literally nowhere to go but up. Even just giving him a functional recovery makes an enormous difference, and then you throw in some semblance of an out of shield game, less susceptibility to being camped, to grab that doesn't look like this. I'm not asking for S tier here, and frankly there's no chance he's getting it. He doesn't excel in any of these areas, and he's still a big slow brute and has the inherent weakness of one, but just giving him a chance in more scenarios is plenty enough to put some agency in his player's hands. And if somehow we ever actually do get a version of Ganondorf that works like this, you know I'll be one of them. Thanks for watching everyone, and let me know what you thought of this take on the Demon King. Likes and comments are a huge help in YouTube's algorithm, so if you think this video deserves it, much appreciated. You can check out my link rework above, video from my second channel below, and patrons, YouTube members, and Twitch subs got this video early alongside other cool perks. Later people!